Good afternoon. This is Chris Burrows with the Transportation Intermediaries Association. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs here at the association and here to talk about a topic that's been plaguing your industry, uh, especially your recent months and years, uh, double brokering. Uh, before I'll kind of walk into kind of what TIA is doing to combat double brokering uh, and some of the things that you all can do uh, as logistics companies in this space to kind of protect yourself and kind of weed out some of these bad actors in the double brokering space, let's kind of set the stage a little bit of what is double brokering. I think there's a lot of misnomers out there about what constitutes double brokering, who are some of the players in the, uh, in the equation. Uh, so let's just kind of touch on that real quick. So double brokering to us is when, uh, let's say, a logistics company, uh, one of our members, uh, selects a trucking company uh, or somebody they may pretending to be a trucking company to move their customer's freight. Either uh, the trucking company is legitimate or not legitimate, like I mentioned, uh, and really unbeknownst to the logistics company, the TI member that selects that truck, uh, that load then gets rebrokered or double brokered out to an ad another carrier. Uh, and, you know, like I mentioned uh, earlier, this could be a legitimate trucking company that may have taken too much off in terms of they didn't have the capacity to do it. They may have taken too much off their plate uh, and they just didn't have the wherewithal to get, get it from point A to point B. So they're going to rebroker it out to another uh, carrier. Uh, unfortunately, they do not have uh, brokerage authority to do that. So that's where the, uh, the double brokering side of things comes in. Uh, what we're seeing more and more prevalent, I think is probably the second example, is fraudulent companies coming into the space, um, pretending to be trucking companies, getting their authority with FMCSA, which isn't too difficult to do, uh, for 30 days or so, uh, shutting down, burning many carriers, burning many brokers, uh, and then reincarnating into something else 30 days later. Uh, that's probably the more prevalent issue we're seeing, uh, and a lot of these companies that, that we're seeing are kind of uh, based outside the United States, which creates further issues. Double brokering is different from co-brokering. Uh, co-brokering is when a broker knowingly works with another broker uh, that may have uh, capacity in a certain lane uh, that the first broker does not. Uh, but there is typically a written contract agreement between those two brokers knowing that the entity they're working with is going to broker this load out to a trucking company. Uh, co-brokering uh, is totally legal, probably happens on a daily basis. Uh, and something that uh, MAP21, which kind of set a lot of these regulations and, and parameters around unlawful brokerage activities and the broker authority, uh, did, not, uh, did not exclude co-brokering from happening. Co-brokering can happen. So kind of why is this problem getting worse and worse? Uh, there's a variety of reasons for that. I think the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously some of the supply chain crisis, uh, huge volumes that we saw over the last couple of years uh, kind of brought some of these bad actors out of the space, saw potentially as this is an industry they could, could, could exploit, uh, you know, make a quick buck uh, by, doing, by burning some carriers, burning some, burning some uh, brokers along the way. Uh, I think there's a, obviously there's a extreme lack of enforcement by FMCSA. Their hands are tied by this administrative law judge ruling dating back to 2019. Uh, which, does, which, uh, which bars them from enforcing civil penalties on commercial violations. Uh, so they feel like they're, like I mentioned, their hands are tied in terms of what, what they can do. So it's kind of created this situation where, you know, some of these bad actors in the space know that there's really no, uh, no enforcement uh, from the federal government on this. Uh, so, you know, it, it, they've kind of played their hand a little bit and uh, given these folks kind of an opportunity to continue to do this. Um, what are we doing here in this association? We're, you know, we're doing several things, kind of the educational side of things from to our members. Uh, we're reaching out, uh, we're recommending that our members utilize, obviously, uh, written carrier selection processes. Uh, our Highway Logistics Conference recently uh, released a white paper on double brokering, identifying some of the best practices and, and commonalities, some of the red flags that exist out there, uh, that on situations where you know, a member may have been burned by double brokering, Things like looking at email addresses, looking at phone numbers, um, you know, different different red flags that, that kind of resonated with folks as you know has burned them in multiple different times over, over the uh, situations. Um, additionally, that that stuff's going to be incorporated into our care selection framework, which is our landmark uh, framework that, that we uh, have been putting out for I believe uh, 17 or 18 different iterations at this point. Uh, it's an annual update. Uh, you know, utilize that as a, as a resource when you're developing your carrier selection processes within your company. Uh, that would certainly help. And really sticking to those carrier selection processes is key. Uh, additionally, we're working as an association and coalition with several other industry trade groups. 
some of the small owner operators, shipping trade groups, uh, to really kind of educate everyone in the supply chain about, you know, kind of uh, what's going on with double brokering and how we can help from an association perspective to kind of combat this. Uh, you know, double brokering uh, hurts everybody in the supply chain. It hurts the shippers. It hurts the, hurts the brokers. It hurts the carriers. Certainly, and it obviously hurts the end consumer because you know these additional costs have to get added down to the, the supply chain somewhere, and it's going to affect the prices that are at the shelves. Um, so we're working with in coalition with those folks. Additionally, we're working with with Congress to really kind of put some pressure, uh, really on the agency, um, even though they cannot assess civil penalties for commercial provisions. Uh, and violations, like I mentioned before, there are other things they can do to kind of combat this uh, in terms of authority and really trying to go after some of these reincarnated and chameleon carriers that continue to do this over and over again. Uh, so we, we had some language included in the uh, omnibus uh, appropriations package uh, that was included, uh, that was passed uh, last year, at the end of the last year, uh, that puts a little bit of pressure on the agency, you know, telling them, hey, as, you know, congressional leaders here, uh, I mentioned MAP 21 before, you know, hey, us as members of Congress, when we passed MAP 21 back in 2012, we meant this. This is a serious issue. Uh, we, need, we need some action taken on this. Uh, we know that this is a huge problem. We're hearing from you, uh, several of you, on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, we know in talking with the agency, there's tens of thousands of reports that are sitting in the National Consumer Complaint Database about double brokering uh, that there's been limited action on. Uh, we're aware of it. We're cognizant of it. We're working to get addressed. Uh, nothing here in D.C. happens fast, uh, but I feel like we're making some good progress on this front. Uh, and if we can be a resource for you uh, or have any questions or, or instances, uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, and we'd be happy to facilitate a uh, conversation with you and help you kind of guide you along the way. Thanks for your time. really appreciate it.